Hello, I'm Kate Chabot. Welcome to SITREP, your weekly look at the big issues in defence and world affairs. Flexible terms of service, better internet, making people feel valued. A major review recommends a radical rethink of service life and careers. The alternative is a model which is the same for everybody. And to our view, a one-size-fits-all means that you'll end up with a one-size-fits-nobody. We'll hear from one of the report's authors and get Mike's take on whether it's a realistic answer to recruitment and retention problems. More than 20% of people joining the British forces are under 18. We'll hear from a UN panel that has again called for the age limit to go up. To our knowledge, uh, no other country relies on children for such a large proportion of its recruitment uh, to the armed forces. And saving life under the ocean wave, how can people be rescued from a stricken submarine? The submarine rescue vehicle attaches to the submarine rescue hatch. They create a seal between the two and then they open the hatch and people transition into the rescue vehicle. Zidrev with Kate Chabot and Professor Michael Clark. So, Mike, um, we're people focused this week. Uh, We always hear from the most senior officers and politicians that it's the people that really make a military. Yes, and they always say that in the foreword or the preface to defence reviews. They always say that people are our most important asset, and that's obviously true. But then the the chapter on people is always chapter 10 or chapter 12 when they've dealt with all the hardware and the heavy metal and the investment and all the rest of it. And you can't help avoiding the conclusion as a defence analyst that it's always a bit of an afterthought. And, you know, what Nick Pope is trying to do in this report is is think about the offer because the armed forces are changing, British society is changing, so there are a lot of moving parts to trying to get this right for the next 20 or 30 years. Well, top brass and ministers now have 67 recommendations for a radical rethink of life and careers in the armed forces. The review of incentivisation was commissioned by the Defence Secretary because of worries about recruitment and retention. Put simply, people are leaving the forces faster than they're joining. The Haythornthwaite review found many servicemen and women believe promises made to them have not been kept, that they feel disempowered by red tape and bureaucracy, and that life in the forces needs to change to match 21st century expectations. We'll hear from one of the authors in a moment, but first, let's in Forces News reporter Claire Sadler. Uh, Hi Claire, Uh, it's a huge report but in essence its message seems to be you need to genuinely put people first. Absolutely. You know, it's really crucial to make people feel valued. That's what it's saying, especially if you want to keep the workforce intact and attract new recruits. And nowadays, the labour market's fiercely competitive with everyone vying for those same skill sets that are out there. And on top of that, the report highlights the demands placed on service personnel are becoming increasingly diverse and unpredictable. So how do you make people feel valued? That's what it's trying to get to the bottom of. You've got to pay attention, it says, to what really matters to them. And once you figure that out, invest your time and money into getting that right. So they look at, you know, what is it that employees want? Flexibility in their work arrangements, including options for remote and hybrid working, to operate in a digital first environment and have opportunities for these multi-phase careers. And they say that that old approach of take it or leave it just won't cut it with future generations. So something has to be done. And Claire, one of the biggest complaints about service life is the poor state of some accommodation. What solutions does this review suggest? I mean, given what we've just discussed about making people feel valued, putting them into poor accommodation just doesn't do that. So it wants to prioritise or a priority to be put on replacing and upgrading the current stock and tell everyone what you plan to do and make sure that personnel see and benefit from those changes. Um, The report also spoke positively about a a provision that's within the current future defence infrastructure services contract, which will allow local commanders to address local issues and they get to spend up to £25,000 without needing prior approval. And that's all about trusting them to make the decisions and empowering them to take the action. But the report uh, says that there are some restrictions that prevent commanders from fully utilising it. They want those removed and they suggest increasing it to £100,000. And what are they recommending about pay and allowances? 
Well, first of all, about the allowances system, uh, the way it stands, it's just overly complicated, paperwork heavy and inflexible. The system needs to be simplified, basically. And in relation to pay, this isn't about a pay review, but a, a more flexible pay model so that you're rewarding individual knowledge, skills and experience. It's about greater recognition of individual value. Um, and this, they say, would work best hand in hand with a more flexible career model, uh, which is what they also advocate. So a move away from pay simply linked to rank. And there's a whole section on digitalization. Why do they say that matters? Well, it's what's expected, isn't it? And it's more effective for a start uh, as a way to manage people and to allow the armed forces to communicate uh, with, with those people. Digitalization uh, streamlines processes for the organization. So ultimately, it should save them some money. Uh, and, and so also uh, the report talks about the connectivity goal uh, on operations. And they want there to be a provision for at least one welfare video call a week while people are away serving. Claire, thank you very much for that. Well, central to the whole plan in this review is replacing one-size-fits-all military careers with what they call a spectrum of service. It would give people more choice about how long they sign up for, how much they move around or are away from home, and more flexibility to move between regular and reserve service or return to the forces from civilian life. But can military careers really be that flexible? A leader of civilian businesses was deliberately chosen to lead the review, but he had a military advisor, former Deputy Chief of the General Staff, Lieutenant General Sir Nick Pope. The integrated operating concept that the, the department sort of espoused two years ago was asking for greater levels of commitment from the armed forces. It was asking for greater skills levels from the armed forces. But if you looked at society, young men and women in the 21st century require or are after more uh, agency, they're after more choice. You therefore look at the people system of the department, which is generally bottom up fed um, individuals. Young men and women required to undertake extraordinary things every day. Selfless commitment, these kind of values that um, we've had in the military context. And you map that to this new supply system and you say to yourself, is it fit for purpose? Our, our take was probably not. And, and if it's not fit for purpose and people uh, might be looking for shorter careers, uh, part time careers, uh, move temporarily to being a reservist, for example, can that complete flexibility actually work in a military context? Certainly not for everybody. And, and of course, when you join up, you know, you're looking for. Uh, a career at the get-go, which will require of you probably reasonably high levels of commitment. But the point that we are trying to make is from the get-go, people want more, more choice. They want to have more flexibility. And certainly as you go through your career, that becomes increasingly pertinent. And what is the benefit to the forces and our military capability to allowing people this career flexibility? I think it plays two ways. I think if you don't, then there's arguably a chance that the uh, armed forces will not be able to attract sufficient young men and women in the 21st century to meet the needs of filling the ranks. I also think of it in the future where you think about young men and women in the 21st century wanting plural careers or portfolio careers. The opportunity to, to serve for two, three, four years to gain skill sets to take those out into employment outside of the forces, and then to come back in again on a, a zigzag career at a higher rank potentially, or to bring in other skill sets. That's the kind of territory where you're looking at blurring the boundaries between those who are serving and those who have served. Another big part of the report is about creating people value propositions. I just want to read a bit that I think sums that up quite well. Don't say we recognise the importance of a healthy work-life balance. Do say serving in the armed forces is a 24-7 commitment. And at times you will be asked to deliver on that at short notice. When you do, we will recognise that in the reward package you are given by doing X, Y, Z. What kind of things are X, Y and Z and what kind of commitments are you talking about making there? So the department needs to do some work on this because the current uh, delineator it uses for all service uh, personnel is X factor. So everybody gets you know, 13 and a half, 14 and a half percent uh, of, their, of their remuneration through this X factor, which is designed for the exigencies of service. 
but it's quite a blunt tool right now. And the point that we are trying to make is that denies individuals choice. Let's say, for instance, there's a time in your career when you've got a young family, you're, let's say, a major in, in the army, and you want to say to your career management organization, do you know, for the next six or seven years, I value stability. I want to remain in the same location with my family. And in so doing, I want to dial down my commitment levels a bit so I can ensure this stability. And as a consequence of that, I may get less in terms of the fiscal remuneration aspect aligned to what we currently think of as X factor. You can therefore offer choice to people On the commitment side, you've got a variety of commitments. So from an army perspective, it may be about an operational tour in Estonia. From the Navy, it may be about ships deploying routinely onto the Ogden. From the Air Force, it may be about operating high technology equipment out of RAF Waddington. Everybody has a different view about commitment. The view of the report is that that kind of reward mechanism which talks about commitment needs to be thought through very, very carefully to come up with a future package. And that flexibility, it might work for some roles, but not for others. Isn't there a danger of creating a two-tiered armed forces? I wouldn't disagree that it's, it's a model that's going to be different for everybody. But the, the alternative is a model which is the same for everybody. And to our view, a one-size-fits-all means that you'll end up with a one-size-fits-nobody. Let me give you another example. In our current system... The reward mechanism is very, very closely aligned to rank. There are some parts of the organization, particularly in the engineering functions, where you might think actually about privileging skill rather than rank as a, as a, as a reason for reward. I mean, the most obvious example might be the cyber community, where actually we're currently using promotion as a mechanism to pay people more money. Arguably, um, for a cyber operator, it should be about competency and skills that's actually the reason for remuneration. And what we've argued in the report is not not to lay down a sort of an architecture for the entire organization. Uh, And each of the services have been quite enthusiastic about the idea of putting forward some trials, some pilots to see what would work in this particular area. Nick Pope, great to speak to you. Thank you so much for your time. A pleasure. Thank you very, very much. And Mike, uh, to play devil's advocate for a moment, there will be people who hear things like commitments to internet connectivity, choosing to stay home, and think this is the force is going soft. It's not going to help deliver hard military power. Yes, and I think there's a general recognition that uh, the, the qualities that we're looking for, or the, the country's looking for, requires different sorts of people. As, as one ex-military officer said, expressed it to me, he said, we're, we're not just looking anymore for people who can carry their luggage across the Brecon Beacons in rotten weather. There's always an element of, of that, and you'll always need the hard edge for sure, but you need lots more skills. Even people at the hard edge who are carrying their luggage across the Brecon Beacons in rotten weather have got to be skilled, as we see in Ukraine, at using drones and computers and all the rest of it. So the the mix of skills is very, very different. And I think there's a, a key difference here in what Nick Pope was saying, um, you know, trying to make the offer more attractive to our modern youth entirely Mm. sensible if we're talking about expeditionary operations then of course they want people wanted to fit in with their lifestyle and what they're planning for the next few years but if we were talking about a national emergency then i think that young people would react the way they reacted in the past in britain and the way they react in ukraine these days i think if we were talking about a real national emergency i think a lot of reservists would say that's it okay i'm in the forces now So 67 recommendations now being considered by ministers and chiefs of staff. They asked for this review. So should we assume they'll do what it's asking? I'm not going to hold my breath. (laughs) Um, There are a lot of recommendations. And this is a time of of enormous strain on the defence budget, regardless of the four year spending spending commitment that's been made. And always you're back to this reality that if you're looking to cut expenditure, the simplest thing to cut that makes the biggest saving is paying pensions. You know, that if you can cut the number of people involved in anything, then you save on pay and pension payments. And that actually makes a, a big difference to the budget. And so this downward trend in personnel is hard to see being reversed unless or until the British government makes a much bigger commitment to defence of the sort I believe it will have to make in the next three or four years. And I think this is what I've seen of it so far. It's a very good review. Um, Will they do it? Um, I'm not sure. They'll do some of it. Will they do all of it? Mm. I bet they won't. 
Now, um, recruitment to the armed forces has always been mostly focused on bringing in young people at the very start of their careers. More than one in five of those joining the armed forces is aged 16 or 17. That puts us out of step with the rest of Europe and NATO, which all have a minimum military recruitment age of at least 18. The Ministry of Defence has long defended its approach, arguing it offers opportunities for young people to develop technical and life skills and that there are rigorous safeguards including parental consent and Ofsted oversight of training. Under 18s are also not allowed to deploy to conflicts. But a United Nations panel has called for the UK to raise its recruitment age to 18. The UN Child Rights Committee say the UK is not in breach of its commitments by recruiting at 16, but they raise a list of concerns about the practice and call for better safeguards. Professor Benya Mesmer sits on the committee. We understand that children can apply to join the British Army at 15 years and seven months and are permitted to begin training as a junior soldier at 16. In fact, to our knowledge, no other country in the world relies on children for such a large proportion of its recruitment uh, to the armed forces. There were also concerns that recruitment in areas of deprivation uh, was significant. There were also concerns about uh, the safeguards that are provided, uh, the mental health issues uh, that were raised, uh, sexual abuse related issues that were of concern. Uh, and indeed, uh, if we want to take the Convention on the Rights of the Child seriously, these are uh, serious issues that need to be addressed. And what is the problem, though, actually, in your view, with 16-year-olds choosing to join up? Because, as I said earlier, there are safeguards in place, that there is a need for parental consent, there is Ofsted oversight of training, and they will not be deployed to a conflict zone at that age, not until they're 18. So what is your actual problem with the age? So let me, let me latch on to the point about safeguards. Uh, we understand that the government uh, has put in place uh, safeguards. Now, the optional protocol requires, for instance, uh, all potential child recruits to be fully informed. Uh, now, the terms of service for the army in some circumstances are not provided to recruits uh, or parents uh, before they enlist. So even in, this is an example where even in the instances where safeguards are put in place, uh, those safeguards uh, are not uh, implemented in full. Uh, we had some information that showed that uh, while signed parental consent uh, is actually provided uh, remotely on a form, uh, recruiters are not required to meet parents before they, uh, their child enlists. That also highlighted some gaps in terms of the, the, the safeguards. Uh, to add to that, normally the signatures uh, of both uh, parents are required uh, as evidence of consent, uh, but not when parents are actually separated uh, or divorced. And this arrangement actually can put uh, a strain on separated families. So in the grand scheme of things, the main reason why we would like to have children protected uh, is mainly because of their vulnerability. You mentioned the concerns over over-representation of children from socioeconomically disadvantaged backgrounds in the armed forces. Why is that a problem? That, at face value, might not... In fact, uh, I'm glad you're raising that point. Uh, one of the points uh, that the UK government mentioned was that this is voluntary and, in fact, gives an opportunity for some sort of a training, a vocational training. If poverty is actually depriving these children of opportunities uh, and if that's actually the main reason why they're being driven in this direction, uh, then that would definitely be, uh, be a concern there. Uh, I mean, the counter argument to that is that uh, many people who may have come from deprived backgrounds, they've turned their lives around by joining the armed forces. I'm, I'm, I'm sure there are instances uh, where that's also at the core of the argument that the state has made. It's, it's not the most significant concern uh, that the Committee on the Rights of the Child has, but it's one of the concerns. Uh, you could argue that actually ending recruiting at 16 would actually deprive people from impoverished backgrounds of a significant opportunity. Uh, the counter argument to that would be, uh, are there not better programs, uh, interventions uh, that actually provide children from impoverished backgrounds to have better opportunities, opportunities that do not expose them uh, to recruitment and potential use, uh, opportunities that actually could put them at the risk of sexual abuse, uh, opportunities that could compromise their mental health. Uh, there are a long list of countries throughout the world. Uh, developed, developing, uh, that have actually uh, managed to give opportunities to, to children from impoverished backgrounds that do not necessarily put them at some of the risks that I just mentioned to you. 
Professor Benjamin Mesmer from the UN Child Rights Committee. The Ministry of Defence says it's proud of the opportunities serving in the armed forces affords young people, that recruitment of under 18s meets all legal and policy requirements, and that it takes the duty of care extremely seriously. On the specific issue of potential sexual abuse, the forces point to a new zero tolerance policy implemented just over six months ago, under which anyone found guilty of unacceptable behaviour will be sacked even if it's not a crime. Uh, Mike, are we out of step with our allies and most of the world? Both major political parties seem committed to recruitment at 16, so it seems unlikely to change. Yes, I don't think it will. I mean, the fact is we are out of step with other countries, but the crude fact is it works for us. And I think it works for a lot of our young people, particularly as we were talking about there. They're not all from deprived areas, but a lot of them are. And you know, children from deprived areas are likely to suffer problems in any case. And if they suffer from those problems in the army or the forces, they suffer from them within a social framework that cares for them, that can do something about it. Now, I, I think you know, Professor Mesmer is, is not wrong when he says, well, we could do more on the safeguarding side. There could be more checks on the recruitment process. And I think there's, there's reasons to, be, to think about that carefully. But really, it, it's, 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 this is not a problem as far as we're concerned. And, you know, I remember there was a, a statement by a parent of a, a soldier who was over 18, who had been in mm. the army sometime. He was killed in Afghanistan. And the parent made an astonishingly effective statement. He said, we weren't much of a family to our lad. But the army was his family and he loved them and they loved him. So that's all right. Oh, that's very thought provoking. Thanks, Mike. Well, now on to the disappearance of a submersible vehicle on a trip to explore the wreck of the Titanic. It's highlighted how dangerous operating deep in the ocean can be. If something goes wrong, the options for rescue are limited, but not non-existent. While rescue attempts were unable to save anyone from the sunken Russian submarine Kursk in 2000, five years later, the Royal Navy Scorpio 45 undersea vehicle freed a Russian submarine that had been tangled in cables and nets for three days. So what are the rescue options for a submarine and what are the limits for such a mission? Ryan Ramsey is a former captain of the submarine HMS Turbulent. He went on to lead the Royal Navy's submarine command course. The submarine rec- rescue missions are um, complicated, but they're practiced and rehearsed by different organizations all over the world. The first thing to recognize that if, if a submarine gets in distress, no matter what its nation or nationality, uh, all submarine forces respond in order to provide the rescue service that's, that's required. Initially, they'll have a location of the submarine, so they'll know that uh, it's in a particular position. And when it's in that position, what they'll do is send out rescue forces that consist of a submarine parachute action group that fly out and then they drop into the water with boats to provide communications. Then ships will arrive, um, and then a ship carrying, in in particular case for NATO, the NATO submarine rescue vehicle, um, they'll arrive, launch the submarine rescue vehicle down to the stricken submarine. And is it possible to safely get people out from a sunken sub, or do you have to rescue the whole vessel? For, for submarines, it is possible and is practiced all the time. So in, in essence, the submarine rescue vehicle attaches to the submarine uh, particular hatch, a rescue hatch. They, they uh, create a seal between the two and then they open the hatch and people transition from the submarine into the rescue vehicle and then back to the surface. It's basically a manned uh, submersible. Um, it's controlled by pilots. Now, obviously, the rescue vehicle is significantly smaller than the submarines, so they have to do that on numerous occasions to uh, transport an entire crew. Presumably a very different thing than from rescuing a submersible. Very difficult, uh, very different and very difficult um, for for the submersible. It's a totally different activity. And can that system only help NATO submarines? Is it only designed to work with them? No, it's not. So all submarines, um, not most submarines, because they're not all submarines, but most submarines across the world have a standard escape hatch. So they standardise the escape hatches, even if it was a potentially enemy submarine, they standardise the escape hatches so anybody could go and rescue. And these were lessons from the curse when the Russians wouldn't let us uh, initiate a rescue uh, and we could have saved life then, but they, they, the, the politics uh, played out. And what's the deepest that a submarine rescue can realistically take place? 
So um, in the uh, open source, it says that the NATO submarine rescue system can go down to 600 metres. 600 metres is exceptionally deep, so most submarines don't operate at that depth at all, but they are designed to structurally to be able to survive that depth. The first challenge, of course, is often finding the missing vessel. How hard is that and, and how is it done exactly? You talked about uh, the warnings, that the, the alerts going out at the beginning. Can you just talk a bit more about how difficult it is? Well, it's difficult if the submarine doesn't let you know that they've got a problem. So all submarines carry what's called a submarine indicator buoy. And one of the initial things that uh, the crew does is release that indicator buoy. That indicator buoy is tethered to the submarine. So the indicator buoy uh, floats to the surface. Um, a satellite signal is sent uh, directly to emergency satellites. Um, that's picked up by headquarters, and it instantly the headquarters will know that a submarine is in distress in an exact position. If they don't release the, the indicator buoy, then once again, you know where the submarine is operating because they have what's called water space management. You you send out uh, exactly where you're going to be operating or an area that you're going to be operating. When you were serving on the subs, obviously safety was key to your work, but how much did you think about the situation you'd be in if something did go wrong? Every day. So so the training that all submarine services receive um, is significant to make sure that you're able to deal with taking a platform that's more complex than spacecraft into an area that's less explored than space. So when I did it, um, we used to do the submarine escape training tank, which allows you to do uh, a fence from 30 metres in, in water. Um, everybody who's a submariner gets trained um, when they initially join the submarine service, but then you do repeat training in those facilities every two to three years. And you train and you train and you train even when you're there. But for me, when I was captain, whilst it didn't dominate my day, I was always thinking, what if and what are we going to do if? And all submariners have that mentality. What experience have you had in your career as a submariner with a crisis? So I've had many crises uh, on board submarines, um, particularly as they're really complex pieces of machinery and and they, they, things go wrong. Um, and, and it has some form of emotional effect. If I describe one for you, um, in 2011, we suffered a catastrophic failure of all of our air conditioning plants, which might sound innocuous, but in water temperatures of uh, 37 degrees Celsius and being on the surface of 42 degrees Celsius, uh, very quickly, the uh, inside of the submarine became so hot and it became uncontrollable. And then people dropping from heat exhaustion. Now, professionally, you go in, you see the problem, you work the problem through, everybody tries to work a solution to recover the situation. But the emotional angle that I, I never used to talk about was the fact that at that moment, I remember looking at a picture of my kids and thinking, I'm never going to see them again. That was horrific for me. However, I, I was the captain. We, we needed to lead through this and we got through it and we managed to manage to save the submarine and then went back on operations. So um, it, it does have real triggers and the training is the key to everything. The training kicks in and you manage it like a situation despite the emotional uh, tugs that it does when you, when you wonder whether you're going to get through this. Ryan Ramsey, thank you very much for sharing that with us. And it's good to see you here today. Thank you very much for your time. You're welcome. Mike, um, it's a sobering reminder, isn't it, of the risks many submariners are taking on our behalf. And submarines seem to be of growing importance for UK defence. Yes, they are. The submarine world and the world of the deep sea is the new unexplored area of warfare. We're talking now about drones, not just manned submarines, but lots of undersea drones, which are in their infancy at the moment. But remember that we know more about space and outer space, a lot more than we know about our own undersea world. And that's it's a whole new realm, which is becoming more and more important. And, and as a, you know, somebody myself, I've been, you know, long been a diver and a, and a sailor, a very amateur in both cases. Um, but I can tell you that the simplest thing on land, like tying a knot in a, in a line or clipping something onto your belt or opening a Velcro pocket and putting something into your pocket, the simplest thing becomes difficult when either you're bobbing on the surface or under the surface. Water makes everything dif different. And the simplest mm. things underwater are remarkably different.
Mike, thank you so much. And my thanks to all of our guests. That's just about all for now. And there's much more from Lieutenant General Sir Nick Pope on incentivising the armed forces in an extra edition of the SITREP podcast. We discuss in more detail the ideas for changing pay structures, why being connected really matters, and how little changes can make people feel more valued. That's online now at bfbs.com slash SITREP or wherever you get your podcasts. Professor Michael Clark and I will be back next Thursday for now, though, from me, Kate Chabot, thank you for listening. Bye-bye. News, discussions and analysis. This is SITREP.